Well, hello everyone, and thanks for coming to the session this afternoon. Uh, my name is Claire Middleton Detzner, and I'm on the research team at ISCME, which is the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education. And we are a um, technology provider, and uh, we run OER Commons, and we're a research institute located in Half Moon Bay, California. And uh, as part of our, our recent research grant that we had with the Hewlett Foundation, we've been exploring um, OER and alternative certification models and have developed a preliminary analysis framework for that which we're presenting to you today. Uh, we're writing a paper on this topic, so this presentation is actually a chance for us to share our preliminary findings and our preliminary analysis framework and get some input from all of you on that. Um, as most of you know, this has been a very hot topic in the news as of late, and um, as a research institute, we're, look, we're interested in looking at what the literature is saying about how some of these new models are uh, emerging and, and impacting the education field, um, and also thinking about what will really be the impact of this on the education field as a whole. So we'll go ahead and get started, and if anybody has any questions uh, throughout the session, you can use the chat window um, in the bottom left of your screen. And uh, Rudy Rubio, my co-presenter, will um, alert me that you've uh, asked a question and so I can address it immediately throughout the, the presentation. Um, and Rudy will be presenting uh, a piece of the presentation a little bit later as well. Um, so well, with that, we'll just get started. So as I mentioned, um, we've been working with the Hewlett Foundation for, for quite some time. Um, that project involves running OER Commons, which is a repository of open educational resources. And we also have a fellowship program where we work with teachers um, who become champions and learn about OER uh, through OER Commons and become authors of OER themselves. Um, but this work is really an outgrowth of, of all of our work with teachers and with OER. You know, what are, we're looking at how can OER be applied to some new models for certification um, and for, for new pathways for people to move through the education field. So just to talk a little bit about context, um, you know, obviously there's sort of a, a context within, these, with, within which these new OER alternative certification models are, are happening and there's new innovations that are occurring based on these, these contextual, um, this contextual setting. And one of them, of course, is the rising cost of education. Um, increasingly, students are not able to afford college, especially a four-year college, and it's becoming less and less affordable each year for students. Um, and due to de decreases in funding at the state level, um, the number of classes that are available to students is also decreasing. So uh, students are really demanding more fle flexible class times, and that, that's what they're demanding in order to meet their own needs as learners. So a lot of students today are both working and going to school at the same time, and they can't devote the same amount of time to um, to education as students have in, in previous decades. Another contextual factor is the need to better align workforce needs with the needs of students. So um, students are really looking for education pathways that can really help, that they can apply in the workforce setting. Um, and employers are also demanding that same thing in our knowledge-based economy. There's, there's new skills that are needed um, and, work, and employers are demanding that. Additionally, there's a, a demand among both instructors and students for learning resources that are, that are more flexible and more affordable and more interactive. And uh, with the advent of web-based technologies, um, the education field has, you know, can respond to some of these needs and provide some more interactive and flexible learning resources. And OER is certainly a pathway in order to allow people to do that. As part of our work with this project, we've uh, done a review of the literature about what, what's being said about alternative models, and, and these are a few um, highlights from that. One of them is that these new technologies, and particularly online community spaces, are shifting the ways that students and teachers are interacting with each other, and also the ways that they're interacting with new information and data. They have better ability to um, create their own information, create their own knowledge, and there's new data that's accessible now to teachers and students about their, accessible to teachers about how their students are doing in their classes and also accessible to students to help them track how they're doing in their classes. 
Also, some of these new models are offering students um, ways of accessing education that are somewhat boundaryless. You know, they can in, they can go into education pathways and exit them as they please. They may not have actual terminal degrees at the end of them. Um, in some cases, there's just not traditional start and end points to some of these new pathways. It's more uh, students can come in and take what they want and get what they need and get the skills that they need and then exit the pathway with those skills under their belt. With this, um, those that are providing some of these new alternative models are grappling with right now, how can we better assess and evaluate students' achievement um, through these new pathways? And that's something that we'll explore in this conversation. And also, some new questions are emerging about who's going to benefit from some of the new pathways and how they might be integrated with traditional learning pathways and also with traditional, um, with, with current workforce needs. So that's just a little bit about what the literature has been saying about um, some of these new alternative pathway models. Now, in, um, in conducting this study and, and developing this analysis framework, we found a need to really define what we meant by OER-based alternative certification models. So um, as you'll see a little bit later, our analysis framework is an analysis of uh, 13 um, different alternative learning models. And to determine um, which ones we would actually include in the study, we, this was our working definition. So number one, we decided that the models that we would include in the framework would support student learning through the use of either OER or freely available content. Um, that the courses offered would have content that was bundled into topics or knowledge areas. Um, that these models would um, be guides for learners to build their knowledge um, that through offering things like feedback mechanisms or increasingly challenging content. So um, it wasn't just you know a, a model that or a piece of material that was put out there on the web, but rather it was organized and structured in such a way that a learner could move through the content and that there would be some reward if, um, for learners to master content, whether that was a degree, a certificate, or some form of a badge. And the final um, definition piece was that the model had been publicly launched and is currently available. So we haven't included anything that's still in development. And these are the research questions that are guiding this research work. Uh, first of all, what what OER and open, and open access based pathway models exist and how do they work? So which, what's out there and, and how are they being structured? What kind of offerings are being, are being made for students today? Secondly, how can these new pathway models best be categorized and understood? And we looked at a number of different dimensions of that. A couple of, that will be, a couple of those will be highlighted in the analysis framework. A third question is, how are these models distinct from formal education pathways, and what kind of gaps do they fill, and what gaps yet remain in this field? Fourth is, what are the possible implications of these new models for teaching and learning? So how are they really changing the way that education is provided, and, and the way that uh, the kind of pedagogical concerns that teachers are concerned with, and also how students are really accessing learning? And finally, we looked at how if these models really took off, what would it mean for education as we know it? And how, how radical of a change might this be to the way that education is being delivered? So the research study has a few components. First, we did a review of the literature to look at all of the recent thinking on the factors that are driving the emergence of these models and how this differs from traditional pathways. Secondly, we looked at um, a number of OER, 13 OER and open access based alternative pathway models. And we looked particularly at how they support and recognize learning through technology, content, their pedagogical approaches, and other factors. And um, as we move into the analysis framework, Rudy will be talking a little bit in a little bit more detail about that. And then we developed the analytical framework, which is a way of assessing and categorizing these models to help answer our, our key questions. Great, thanks. And Ruby, I think we'll go ahead and start presenting. Great, thanks, Claire. Um, so I'm going to be Great. discussing the analytical framework that we use to organize how we looked at the alternative pathways models included in this analysis. And I just want to introduce that with the caveat that this framework is still a work in progress. Um, and it's not intended in any way to be a comprehensive map of all the alternative pathways models that are currently in the space. And as I'm sure you're all aware, these models are kind of popping up every single day, kind of touching on different subjects, topics, 
um, learning pathway approaches. What we wanted to do with these particular models was select ones that, one, were very early in the, um, in the kind of like popular MOOC space or online learning space. Um, we, we focused on those platforms that used OER or open resources, freely available content. And we wanted to select models that were, for the most part, representative of everything that was going on in the space. And we know that, that we're continuing to develop that because, as I've mentioned, there are models popping up all the time that are varying, um, sometimes only slightly, and other times um, to a large degree in maybe how they're approaching finances or structures or, or learning pathway. So we organize these particular models um, according to three factors. One, what type of content they use. Two, the recognition of achievement that students received after completing a course or a lesson. And three, um, the level of interaction with uh, an instructor that a student has. So looking at the first part, whether a, content, whether a platform uses OER or uses freely available content, we can see that it's spread fairly, uh, fairly widely in terms of um, whether, whether a platform uses OER or open educational resources specifically those that are openly licensed, most often by Creative Commons, versus those platforms that use freely available content. Um, these resources, freely available content, are still, um, obviously they're still free. They can still be used by educators. The main difference is that the licensing is not necessarily uh, clear or it could be uh, owned and copyrighted by a particular foundation or institution. But educators are allowed to use them within um, educational context or for learning purposes. Just to kind of give you an idea of, of some of the resources that represent, we did another project on music OER um, and resources that are available just for music learning in general. A lot of the foundation foundations and institutions that we looked at offered resources available to teachers free of charge um, that were copyrighted by that particular foundation or institution, but could be used within the classroom and could be shared between teachers uh, or amongst teachers. However, it wasn't very clear um, how teachers could share them, how widely, um, in what ways. And so that's what we're talking about when we, when we distinguish between OER and freely available content. Um, the second thing that we looked at was recognition of achievement. So what are students receiving after completing a particular lesson or course successfully? Um, our first category was degrees or credit. And these were often affiliated with uh, accredited institutions or institutions that more closely resembled what we think of as a formal institution of education, so a high school or college or university. The second group that were associated with certific certificates of completion. Um, which I'm sure you're all aware of just in terms of following um, the developments in the MOOC space and seeing the partnerships that have arisen from um, some of these platforms, Coursera, Udacity, edX, Venture Lab, and institutions of higher education, uh, either from which they were bred or um, that were brought into a partnership after they were developed. So just to give you an example, edX is a partnership between MIT and Harvard, but they've been successful at bringing other institutions in, such as a University of Texas at Austin, a University of California at Berkeley, to offer free courses on the edX platform. Um, Coursera and Udacity and Venture Lab are all affiliated in some way with Stanford University, but Coursera has really built out this partnership model, um, uh, offering courses from instructors and professors at the universities on their platform. So when students take these courses, and successfully complete it, they receive a certificate of completion most often from the instructor who led the course. Um, there's a lot of stickiness around whether a university can offer a certificate of completion and whether it closely resembles a degree or whether uh, it resembles any other type of credit that the university would award. And these platforms have been very careful to not offer uh, course credit or any certificates of completion themselves. So again, that relies on the instructor. To, to offer the, the certificate. And some instructors make very clear that they don't offer a certificate, so it varies. Um, the final one, the final category is the use of badges. And gamification is kind of taking this 
very prominent role in how we look at um, how we look at uh, models and, and students going through the learning platform. I don't know if I I don't know if I clicked on the slide, but I was wondering if we could go go back just to kind of keep looking at the uh, other slide. Thanks. Um, so um, badges were used to encourage students to go through their own learning models um, or to guide themselves through a particular learning structure. The third the third category that we looked at was the level of interaction with an instructor. In exploring this, we wanted to look at the type of learning model that these platforms employ, uh, employ, uh, employed. And I just want to be make clear that we understand that, that instructor-led versus self-guided is not necessarily a continuum. You can definitely have courses that are instructor-led but that still rely on a students to guide themselves to a particular course. Or you can still have uh, self-guided platforms that have some level of interaction from instructors. And in the course of doing this analysis, we've seen partnerships kind of bubble up and arise between even the platforms within our analysis. For example, um, Open High School of Utah has found that they need to supplement their materials with additional resources in order to meet the Common Core State Standards. And so what they've been doing is bringing Khan Academy lessons in um, into their courses and doing this uh, a flipped classroom approach where students go home, go over the Khan Academy lessons, and then come back and ask questions, which closely resembles the model that they already had. They're just kind of folding in um, an, another platform's courses into what they're already doing. Code Academy has also partnered with New York University to supplement um, the programming courses that they have with more uh, interaction, collaboration, um, human interaction, and so that's something that we'll talk about. Um, I did want to open up. I did want to open it up for a bit of discussion now, maybe in the chat, and I'm kind of reading through what people have um, posted because, as I've mentioned, this is a, this is a framework that's still in development, and we'd love to receive some feedback either on what you think works, what you think doesn't work, what could be changed. Um, anything you think is unclear would really help us to continue thinking about how to continue to develop this model for the for for additional research and analysis. Um, so I'm just going to go through quickly and see what what people have typed in as I've been talking. I mean, maybe fold some of that into a discussion. So as as Jim kind of as Jim points out. Um, Self-guided is not necessarily the opposite of instructor-led, um, which I totally agree with, and that does need some additional refinement. It is something that we've been looking at, um, like the best way to represent a model or represent the learning pathway, especially as models continue to develop, what that looks like for their learners. Um, so if there's, if there's any additional advice about that, that'd be great. Um, So we have one moderator who suggests that they're on different axes, which is something good to keep in mind. Um, and Jim, I hear your point about high instructor interaction and low instructor interaction. That is something that we played with um, for a little while. And so it might be going back to this point of separating out the self-guided versus not self-guided access from the instructor-led one to make it clearer that those are those those are very distinct and not on opposite ends of a spectrum. Um, so, so it's good to hear that that there's some some consensus around what that could look like. I mean, we'll we'll be sure to take that into consideration as we continue to develop this this model. But I do want to I do want to ask if there are any other questions about anything else that's on the model um, outside of the level of interaction with the instructor. And if not, we can go ahead and I can I can move on and I'll provide some higher level higher level analysis of what we saw in exploring how the models interacted and, we're, and after we organized them. Okay, I'll go ahead and, and move forward. Um, so doing a quick overview of how the models were organized, we saw that they were they were categorized into to three categories: uh, degrees or credit certificates. And badges, and we found that those associated with degrees and credit um, were more likely 
fell under this umbrella of formal institution. So Open High School of Utah, Open University, those are what we would consider formal institutions that are accredited to offer degrees and, uh, and credit for courses. Certificates are often offered by models that have partnerships with formal institutions. So, of course, Coursera, Udacity, edX have all partnered with um, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, et cetera, and can offer certificates of completion. And then finally, badges are offered by grassroots models with limited or no ties to formal institutions. We also examined um, accreditation models and fee structures of the courses as these were, these were developing even as we were doing the analysis. We found that only four of the models offered accredited courses. Um, and these were more, some of the more formal ones, like the Open High School of Utah, Open University of UK, um, and Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon. Although two of the models did note that they were working towards moving to some type of accreditation for the courses that users took, um, such as Universities of People, um, Peer to Peer University, and Code Academy. Um, as I've mentioned, Code Academy did partner with, the, with New York University to offer students some type of um, recognition or credit for the courses that they were taking. And this is actually a, an introductory computer, computer science course offered by New York University um, that is using Code Academy's courses and supplementing that with in like maybe, I think, twice a week lectures by experts in the field to help put all of that work in the context. So it's still very self-guided, um, but does have some instructor-led, some instructor interaction, as, as we've kind of discussed. Um, again, we also looked at fee structures. A couple of the models use OER, or open, uh, or freely available resources, but charge students for receiving credit or a degree. So it's as if, um, you know, a student was, was paying a tuition but had access to all the resources for free, which I know some community colleges in the, in the U.S. Are, are, are doing right now. And I actually attended a webinar yesterday where um, community colleges in, in Virginia were using that particular model. So it's not something that's new, but some of the MOOCs and online learning courses are, are starting to adopt it. Um, or, <clears throat> We also found an emphasis on learner-driven learning and content. So even in those courses where there was a high level of, of what we consider instructor interaction, there was still a large emphasis on having students work together, on having peer-to-peer -peer interaction, um, assessments, some type of, 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 of community, community building. Um, you can see, like Khan Academy, for example, and it helps nav uh, learners to navigate their own learning pathway by working through topics with the knowledge map. But as you can see, there was some degree of interaction provided by Open High School of Utah. Um, and Khan Academy actually has built into their platform um, a way for teachers to use Khan Academy in the classroom in a flipped classroom model so that students are getting a supplemental resource of working with a teacher or some type of mentor. Venture Lab, Peer-to-Peer -peer University, I mean, even Coursera all rely on some type of group interaction, whether the students are grading each other's assignments, whether they're doing a group project, whether they're facilitating or participating in a group or community uh, discussion or chat room. Um, there's all, they all rely on some type of peer-to-peer of -peer interaction. And one of the founders of Coursera has actually come out to provide um, some inner information on how that's a bit of a double-edged sword in terms of the quality of feedback that students might receive from their peers might not be as high as if they were to receive one-on-one -on -one personalized attention from their instructor. However, having this group or peer-to-peer -peer interaction re-emphasizes the type of content that's important within the course and kind of re-exposes students to what they should be learning. For example, if you're, if you're in a humanities course and you're relying on your peers to grade your paper, students might not be, you might not focus on spelling and grammar, especially if English is not the first language of, of one of your peers. And so what you would instead focus on are their ideas, the way that they're forming their argument, the structure of their argument and organization. And, and 
and as a result, students are being re-exposed to the content that they should be learning and have a better understanding of what's important. So a bit more refinement is necessary there, but as you can see, a lot of the models are employing some type of, of learner-driven content or learning. Um, the last bit is that a lot of the models are using learner data to gauge and personalize learning. So Open High School is very um, outspoken about collecting data on their students, feeding that back to students and to teachers to help teachers personalize their courses around challenges and difficulties that their students might be having. Uh, having. Open Learning Initiative, or OLI of Carnegie Mellon, does the, does the exact same thing um, and encourages teachers or helps to helps teachers to kind of work through how they might want to structure their classes around, um, again, challenges and difficulties that students are facing. edX is a really good example of not only a, pl of a platform that not only collects student data to feed back to the user and to feed back to the instructor, but to continue developing and informing the development of their platform. Um, if you go onto edX's site, they do mention that they are collecting data on students such as how long they take them to answer a question, what resources they rely on um, in order to answer that question to help them develop their model a little bit better. So while learner data is absolutely important for helping to personalize a course for a student, we also see that models are aware that it's as equally important to, to collect this data in order to inform their own platform and to, to refine learning models for, for their users. Finally, we see somewhat of a trend towards competencies and soft skills. As Claire mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, there is a greater need for specific skill sets by the market, and some of the online platforms are trying to meet this. Um, we see two of the models uh, planning to, to not only provide specific skill sets, but also support learners in connecting with potential employers upon the completion of their curriculum. So there's a direct connection there between what the models are offering and the eventual outcome, eventually kind of getting that user into the marketplace. Udacity is, or at least the founders of Udacity have been um, more outspoken about preparing students for a career in technology. And so a lot of the courses that were initially offered on that platform focused on STEM, so mathematics, computer science, and, and, and technology. Code Academy was very similar in offering, or is very similar in offering only programming and coding languages. Um, but again, they've partnered with an institution of higher education to help students kind of supplement that programming knowledge with what they call flexible thinking. So a soft skill um, where they can put that programming knowledge into a context that's usable, uh, useful in, in a real world setting. And finally, Allison uh, prepares learners for specific professions like nursing and childcare and goes the extra mile by connecting users with potential employers. Employers have the option of signing up on Allison um, and finding users who, for example, scored well on an exam and prompting them right away to, to complete some, um, a quiz either within the hour or within the day and kind of open up a relationship with a potential employee that way. So now Claire will uh, walk us through what this all means. What are the key implications uh, that we've seen in the analysis of our platform? I'm sorry, I had to uh, press the talk button again. Sorry, everyone. Um, this is Claire, and so I was just saying one of the things that we're looking at in our writing of this paper is um, what are the implications of some of these new models for the education field as a whole, and, and what kind of pressure are these new models placing on traditional learning institutions, and, and what is the potential for new innovations that are coming out of this? And one of them, uh, one of those uh, new innovations is about partnerships. It's about the way that partnerships are developing between traditional learning institutions and new pathways, um, as well as between for-profit and not-for-profit organizations. And there's also examples of how these alternative learning models are partnering together. You know, Khan Academy materials being used by 
uh, Open High School of Utah. So in various ways, there's cross-sector collaboration occurring uh, within the education field that um, could potentially really change the way that education is delivered and change the whole landscape of education in this country. Additionally, we're seeing a, a change in the way that curriculum resources are developed and the way that they're used by both teachers and learners. And um, this is true in the OER field as a whole. You know, there's increasingly, uh, through the new technology and open licensing, there's new ways for content to be bundled together, um, ways that components of resources can be pieced together, and the ways that um, we can create modularized uh, learning resources that can be um, taken and used and adapted in different ways. Additionally, we're seeing that the alternative models are, are both supporting traditional learning institutions and also putting pressure on them to change the way that they're delivering uh, educational content. Alternative pathway models are also putting pressure, um, or excuse me, are also in different ways meeting workforce needs in new ways by emphasizing uh, competencies um, that employers really need. So there's partnerships occurring here between uh, the new alternative pathways and um, in the employer field. And finally, we're, um, we're looking through our analysis of this paper at how new learner data is really going to be able to be used. Um, and there's you know, tr tremendous possibilities here for the types of data that can be uh, collected about students and how they move through content and how they, um, how they best learn. But the question is still kind of remains, you know, what is the capacity for institutions to really be able to use that data? And how will institutions and, and these new pathways really, really use the data to create feedback loops that can impact the way that they uh, teach students and, and ultimately student achievement? Our final slide is um, really meant to be a discussion slide. So we'd love to have some input from everybody here. We, you know, we, we see it through this analysis that you know, there's so much going on in the news right now about MOOCs and other alternative learning pathways, and there's a lot of statements you know, being said about what the impact of these can be. Um, there's some fear in some cases about how these might be impacting education, and um, you know, are we creating, <clears throat> I've heard it said, are we creating a two-tier system wherein only some students can access four-year institutions and other students are going to be left to pursue some of these other models? So there's you know, some controversy and some exciting conversation going on right now in the field about how these alternative pathways are, are changing the field. And um, these are some questions that we see that still sort of remain to be answered by, by research and by you know, the, the institutions that are offering some of these alternative pathways. And the first is, I touched on this at the beginning, who will benefit from alternative learning models and who will not? And are there learners that are going to be excluded if we create these pathways that are existing outside of traditional institutions. Secondly, um, we're seeing that the delivery and use of these online and reusable and self-paced content is creating new opportunities for learner analytics, but how do we know if we're collecting the right data and how can we make sure that we are building the right capacity to use the data to facilitate more personalized learning um, for students? Third, we're seeing that this new technologies are enabling the implementation of different kinds of learning activities and pedagogy that can occur within online communities instead of in traditional settings. So how will our understanding of student learning keep stride with some of these changes? And how can we better understand and assess the way that learning occurs in community-based environments? And finally, how will the creation of new partnerships and collaborations influence the education field in the way that our institutions are structured. I'd love to throw these questions out to you all, and if anybody has any comments um, or any additional questions for us about our analysis framework or about our research, um, please jump in. Jim, I see your comment about faculty being suspicious and fearful of these developments. <clears throat> I think that's, I, I've heard that often said as well, and um, I, it's interesting, I, I, my father is a professor, and I spoke to him yesterday as a way to kind of prepare for this presentation. I wanted to know from him, well, what, what kind of concerns do you think I might encounter um, in terms of faculty? And, and while he agrees that some faculty are very, are concerned about being replaced, he also reminded me that, I think he said, 
of, of all of the institutions in the entire world that have, um, that have been around for a thousand years or more, there's like 30 of them, and 17 of those are higher learning institutions. So it's not as though traditional education is going to go away. Um, although these new models are changing the environment and we're interested in seeing how, I think everybody can, can see that you know, traditional learning is still going to occur in a lot of, in a lot of settings. Are there any other comments or questions about the analysis framework that we've presented or any other comments in response to these questions I've presented for the field? Andre, to answer your question, uh, yes, we are a research institute that is located in Half Moon Bay, California. And our research covers how OER is impacting teaching and learning, um, how professional development around OER influences teaching, um, and also how the use of OER and data around learning materials is impacting institutions. So yes, we have a we have a research team in my organization, and this is um, a big part of our research mission. Jim has made a comment about some of the concerns and fears that are out there about um, privately funded education potentially replacing publicly funded education. I think this is also where a lot of the concern around creating a sort of two-tier system comes from. Our country is really founded on the idea that education is the cornerstone of democracy and that public education should be available to all. Um, and with some of with these, with the rising cost of education, the budget shrinking for all of our public education institutions, uh, there's definitely a lot of fear <laughs> out there about how some of these new models might be um, creating alternatives that could be useful and, and benefit students, but that might also take away from the mission of public education. It's certainly a concern of mine personally. I, I just want to jump in there and, and kind of speak to that point I, a little bit about outsourcing public education because I think that it, Im it implies that the third party is not associated with um, formal education or an institution of higher education, whereas some of the models that we included in our framework are actually partnering with institutions of higher education to offer high, high quality courses. Um, there's still, you know, some of the instructors that are leading courses at a brick and mortar uh, building and um, the same types of TAs, the same students who might be taking it. There are other issues of quality around, um, you know, the, maybe from the type of interaction that you're getting from your peers and, and the way that you're getting that interaction. But for the most part, at least for some of the models that we've included in our framework, um, they aren't offering these courses themselves. They're actually partnering with, with institutions to offer students an alternative to the costly courses that we've seen um, or that, that you have at a lot, of, a lot of institutions, especially because of budget cuts. Um, and as, I've, as, as I mentioned, one of the webinars yesterday mentioned how um, there are systems of community colleges that are actually using OER now to build out high quality courses taught by the same professors, um, including the same students, um, in order to help combat some of the budget cuts and, and, and lack of funding. So it is something that it is something that some institutions are, are using, but I definitely hear your um, your point about there being some suspicion around platforms that are funded by venture capital um, that are offering um, courses. And I think those those can be particularly tied to for profit institutions. Um, but even there you have some open platforms that are partnering with for-profit institutions, such as SOFIA, which is partnered with Capella University to offer um, cheaper courses. They're not free, but because they use OER, um, 
the, the tuition is much is, is, is much lower than it would be. So even there, some of the partnerships that are arising in, in the in the uh, the space are um, helping to gain some some traction and legitimacy amongst educators. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I guess I would just add to that um, as well that you know, there really still is, is not has not been very much research done on on what the impact of these um, new models is going to be. You know how I would love to hear of any research that is looking at student achievement or student learning and how it's working across these different models. Um, so I think that you know, as these new models are emerging, there's a lot being said out there, and a lot of fears out there, and a lot of controversy. But we have yet to see really what the impact is, and um, and yet to track how that impact is changing the way that students are learning and how they're achieving within the educational setting. And I'm looking forward to um, learning more about research that is coming up about that, and also participating in, in doing some of that research. So if there are no more um, questions or comments, I think we can wrap it up. Thanks very much for um, participating in the session today. And please feel free to call uh, or email either Rudy or I if you have any questions about the work. And um, we look forward to hearing from you. And we'd be happy to um, share the PowerPoint presentation with you over email. And I believe that there will also be a recording of this session available on YouTube um, at some point in the near future, which the moderator, the Open Education Week, likes to share with us. That's right. The, the, usually, we're averaging about 24 hours on getting the posts up. So if you actually go back to the schedule on the Open Education Week website and you visit the uh, the schedule for yesterday, you have to click um, show expired, then the links will start showing up there right underneath the scheduled time for it. So you can find it that way or you can go to our Open Education Week channel on YouTube and they're being posted there. Great. Thank you, Terry. And thanks everyone. It was great to talk to you today. Thank you.